Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar on Henny Penny Fryer Maintenance. I'm Clint Holder, a partnership builder, aka SVP of Manufacturer Partnerships at Partstown. And I'm joined today by today's presenters from Henny Penny, Jim Anglin, Director of Parts and Supplies, and Pete Krauss, Global Technical Training Manager. Today, Jim and Pete will discuss some best practices to get the most out of the oil you use in your Henny Penny fryer, including tips on filtration, daily upkeep, and daily cleaning, deep cleaning. We will also discuss overall maintenance in, in, to increase fryer uptime and reduce your cost of ownership. At the end of the webinar, I'll wrap things up with a de brief demo on how to use our new serial number lookup feature on partsound.com to find parts for your new Henny Penny equipment. And we'll leave a few minutes at the end for, new, for any Q&A you may have. And now let's turn it over to Pete Krauss, who will kick us off with some tips on how to get the most out of your oil and keep product quality high. All right, so thanks everyone for joining us. My name is Pete Krauss, again, uh, Global Technical Training Manager here at Henny Penny. And I'm excited to bring you all some oil best practices, maintenance best practices, fryer best practices. And you'll notice that I said oil first because that is a huge part of fryer maintenance. And so we're going to break down our webinar today into two sections that I hope everyone gets a lot of tips and tricks. There might be some things that you already know, but I hope there is a lot of things that you pick up from today. Um, this webinar, although it covers Henny Penny fryers, like our Evolution Elite and our 320 series, we're going to focus primarily on open fryers. This also applies to the oil portion and some of the other portions of our pressure fryers and can be used in a lot of other fryers, even if you're not using Henny Penny fryers. Um, we cover our fryers in a general market standpoint today. So if you have like a customer specific version of the fryer, there might be a couple things that might not apply for what we're talking about. Like maybe you use a different filter or have a de different schedule for your clean out or boil out procedure. But in those cases, please adhere to what your restaurant or store is using as they've gone through extensive testing to make sure that their systems work. However, we're gonna give general market best practices and a lot of those do apply to every other customer as well. Um, so again, breaking down this into oil best practices, how to get the most out of your oil and keep product quality high. And you'll see if you take care of your oil, a lot of the maintenance on the fryer becomes so much easier after that. Maintenance and best practices then show you how to increase uptime and then reduce total cost of ownership. And oil best practices are gonna reduce your cost of ownership on the fryer too by spending a little bit less hopefully on your oil. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to get started with oil best practices. Uh, next slide. And so I always like to start with what breaks down oil, just to get that understanding of what we need to avoid and some things we can avoid, but what we need to reduce. And so there's five things that really we want to watch that break down oil. We use an acronym. I don't have it listed here, but we call it WASH. And you can just take the first letter of each one of these words. And it, it, yes, it does have two S's in there. I know we're spelling it incorrectly, but it's an easy way to remember all these. <clears throat> so what we're looking at is water, air, salt, soap, and heat. So I like to cover where do these things come from? How do these things get in your oil or attack your oil? So first is water. Water is coming from the product that we cook in the oil. Anytime you put product in the oil, that product contains water. And you'll see a lot of that re released as steam when it hits your 350 degree oil. However, some of it actually um, mixes with your oil a little bit and then sinks to the bottom and ends up in the bottom of your vat. We'll talk about water. The next one, uh, we'll talk about how to reduce water with uh, a couple things in the future, uh, future slides here. But the next one I'll talk about is air. Air is when oil comes in contact with air, it becomes oxygenated and that breaks down oil. Salt is, uh, is brought into your oil because of breading that you use on your product. Uh, most breadings, almost all breadings, contain some amount of salt. And the most, more we can reduce breading, the less salt is in the oil. And we'll talk about that. Soap, you're probably wondering where the heck does soap come from? No one's taking a bath in the fryer, but soap comes from uh, your boil out procedure or clean out procedure. 
Um, that boil-up procedure, if the vat isn't rinsed properly, you will have soap residue or degreaser residue that gets with, mixes with your oil. There is nothing worse than having degreaser touch oil because the whole job of a degreaser is to break down your oil, and it does a really good job of that. However, if it mixes with your oil, you can really damage oil quickly, and you're like, why do I have to replace this right away? And sometimes you can see that it was because the vat didn't get thoroughly rinsed. And then the last one here is heat. We all know that in order to fry, you got to have heat. That's unavoidable to some extent, but there's ways we can reduce it. Uh, next slide, please. So let's cover some best practices right away. What can we do to help extend oil life and really maintain your oil, but also maintain the fryer? So the first one there we see is number one is filter. Um, Filtration gets rid of the air and salt from your oil, but it also does a lot more that we're going to look at a little more extensively in just a minute or two here. Um, so filtration is probably one of the, the key things. Again, that gets rid of you know water, it gets rid of salt. Number two is turn off the vat when not in use or use idle mode. And I know it's like a lot of people say, yeah, but if we get a rush, we're going to have to turn that back on, and then we've got to wait for the fryer to heat up. But there are times during the day that, that that may be ideal, like between lunch and dinner or at night when things start to slow down, you can start to shut that off one at a time. The longer your oil is under heat at 350 degrees, the faster that oil breaks down. If you're not using the vat, you know, if there's vats that we can get rid of uh, or take offline, you know, either by turning off the heat or idle mode, that will extend that oil life, uh, and, and in some cases dramatically. Um, Henny Penny electronic controls on our fryers all have idle mode built into them. And what idle mode does is it takes the temperature down to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, lowers it by about 100 degrees Fahrenheit from your cooking temperature. And again, those are things that just are so much gentler on your oil. And if you need to use the vat, yes, you do have to wait a couple more minutes for that oil to heat back up to that point, but it's a great option to have there. Um, the third one here, and this one is simple, but I see it abused a lot. <laughs> I see it abused every day, is shake off excess breading or coater away from your oil. This is when a lot of times you see product that's stored in the bag right from the bag, right over the, fry, the frying oil, and all that salt, the salt, um, you know, let's back up a second. All the uh, ice crystals and then excess breading just instantly just goes into your vat, boils away or sinks to the bottom. And, uh, you know, again, that's that salt and water that we want to avoid. Shake off excess breading away from the oil. Typically, I'll see stores do this either, either over like a wastebasket or some, somewhere in the store away from the fryer. Uh, number four, cover vats when not in use, typically at night or if you're shutting down your vats, put a night cover on it. That helps to reduce the oxygen that comes in contact with your oil and also keeps other contaminants out of the oil, you know, dust and things uh, airborne. Number five, just like we talked before, rinse vats thoroughly. So I won't go back into that one. We kind of covered that already. And next slide, please. So then I said we'd talk about filtration, and right now I want to get into filtration because this is a huge part of fire maintenance. Um, first thing is filtration, um, you know, what we want to really do is remove the crumbs that accumulate on the bottom of the vat. Uh, as you cook things, you know, any, any product that you cook, I always say it does two things. One is it releases fall off or uh, breading even if you're not cooking with breading or something like that, like if you're cooking naked wings, even that you'll have fall off from the skin that kind of uh, burns off of there or, or fries off of there. Uh, all that accumulation falls to the bottom of the vat. And really what we want to do is get rid of that because as that is in contact with the oil, that means we have salt and water in contact with the oil. By water, a lot of people are like, really, is there water in oil? <clears throat> well, it sinks to the bottom where it's a little cooler and if anyone's been around a fryer for a while, you'll know that one thing you don't really want to do, I don't advise this, but if you stir up the crumbs in the bottom of the vat, uh, as that, you know, if you have a little bit of accumulation down there, anytime you stir those up, you're going to notice that all of a sudden the vat starts to pop and crack and splatter a little bit. And you're like, whoa, what happened? 
Well, what you did is stirred up the moisture in the bottom, and as soon as that moisture comes in contact with the 350-degree oil, it's going to boil off very rapidly. So that's where that water is. And by filtering, what we do is we drop that down to the filter pan. Once that hot oil mixes in the drain with that water, it, it boils off. And so a lot of times when you filter, you'll notice there's a lot of steam coming off your drain pan. That's the water getting boiled off, and now we get rid of that water that way. Salt, as soon as we get that breading out of the bottom of the vat, that helps get rid of the salts from the oil. So all of those things improve product quality. But I'll tell you that one of the biggest uh, things that I see cause issues, and this is nuisance service calls or problems where we have unexpected downtime dur throughout the day or right when we really don't want it, like during lunch rush or dinner rush, is when the crumbs accumulate to the point where they start to touch the heating element. So that's a bad sign. That's exactly what we want to avoid. We want to filter before that happens. As soon as those crumbs touch your heating element on an electric fryer or burner tubes on a gas fryer, they scorch. Once they scorch, the burnt flavor gets transferred to the rest of your oil, and your customers are going to notice that burnt flavor from your oil. It also darkens your oil, kind of reduces the quality of that quickly, um, and you know darkens it. So if you're testing your oil to replace your oil with a color, um, like a color chart or a sample of oil, typically it's going to get closer to that point where you have to change that oil if you're using that as your method to uh, change. The other thing, now I said avoid nuisance service calls. Well, I've seen many times that crumbs continue to pile up. They cover the, um, and we can see kind of in the middle of that image on the right-hand side, there's a high limit that's covered by a bracket. And I'll see a lot of times crumbs accumulate on those high limits, whether they're on burner tubes like this one on a gas fryer or an electric fryer. They surround that high limit. And that is why a lot of times, like, when you least want it to happen, <laughs> you never want a high limit to trip. But you'll see a high limit trips at inopportune times during the day when you're busy because the crumbs never got filtered or someone skipped a filtration. And now all those crumbs surround and insulate that high limit. By the way, the high limit is designed to shut down your vat um, in the case of an over-temp situation. Well, the oil in those cases is not over-temperature, but right next to your high limit it is because the oil can't escape, and it's just superheating the oil down there around your high limit, and it senses a temperature of 425 Fahrenheit and then shuts off the heat. Now you have to wait for the vat to cool, you have to filter, which wasn't done before, and then pump the oil back up, and once your vat cools, then you can reset that high limit. Sometimes uh, crew members or team members don't know to do that, and they'll get a service call, and you know, call a service company, and all they do is come in and do the same thing and charge you $300. So that's what we're trying to avoid there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so then we, we go into here, how often should you filter? So this is a little bit subjective. Let's start on the left-hand side of the slide. We see traditional fryers. So Henny Penny's 320 series and 340 series are our traditional fryers. That means the vat is greater than or bigger than 50 pounds or holds more than 50 pounds of oil. On those vats, we have a larger cold zone, as you can see in that image a little bit bigger cold zone for crumbs to accumulate. So we don't have to filter as often. So a couple rules of thumb I'll give you, and these are just general best practices. It may vary by the product you're cooking, the volume that you're doing, those types of things. But I have a note down there, filter at least twice per day. I would say filter at least twice per day for frozen pre-breaded product. So if you're cooking frozen pre-breaded, typically it doesn't have as much fall off as fresh breaded. So about twice per day, once after lunch and then once at close is typically what we see, and that works where you can eliminate those crumbs before they build up and touch heating elements or burner tubes. If you do find that crumbs are accumulating faster, then you have to add another filtration throughout the day. Fresh breaded product is a little bit different. If you're doing bone-in fried chicken, there is a lot more fall off from that than you see from a frozen pre-breaded product. And so fresh breaded, that, that's one where I've seen it vary from we filter after every two cook cycles to maybe every five full batches of cook cycles. So those are some things that if you're doing fresh breaded, just monitor the crumbs and you kind of get a feel for, hey, I want, my, I want my team to start filtering after every five rounds or something like that. So if we move to the right side of the slide, then we start looking at a little different scenario for filtration, and that is reduced oil capacity fryers. 
like our evolution elite. So what we want to do there is filter a little bit more often. So those fryers will prompt you throughout the day to filter. They really have very little cold zones, so there's not a lot of room for crumbs. And what I'll say there is if you have one of those style fryers, just remind your team members to filter when prompted. It's a lot easier. And so next, next slide, please. Okay, so an express filter, won't go into this too much, but really what an express filter is is there are intervals that are pre-programmed in the controls based on the amount of product or fall off the product has. And so when we do an express filter, um, do them throughout the day, I just remind team members, always say yes and perform the filtration because they're automated. <clears throat> they don't require you to get your brushes out and scrape the vat down with a pot scraper, or get brushes out and brush off the heating elements. Um, it'll wash down everything that's in the bottom if you do it on a regular interval. If you wait and say, no, I don't want to filter now, nope, I don't want to filter now, and keep doing that, all of a sudden those crumbs pile up where now it's, it, takes, it takes a lot more work. we got to plunge the drain, unclog the drain, let the oil drain, and scoop all the crumbs down more like we would on a traditional fryer. And then those things, again, will lead to high limit trips and things like that. So always say yes to filtration there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so with a daily filter, um, a daily filter is typically done on the end of the day on an evolution elite. So those are those smaller bat fryers. And it, what a daily filter is, is it's almost just like an express filter where it's reminding you throughout the day, except this one is going to ask you to scrub the vat. Um, it just it has a step to scrub, and hey, I got my video playing, so you're going to see a little bit here. The oil drains. You would have to uh, put your heating elements up for an electric fryer, and then scrub the vat. Scrub everything off the burner tubes, heating elements, and then it fills back up. We actually have a rinse step on there, too. So, so that's really all that's added to a daily filter. Now, if you have a more of a traditional fryer, um, you're going to do things manually. It doesn't have an automatic drain or automatic pump that turns on. So you'd manually just turn those things on and off and open your return valve and open your you know, drain valve as uh, the sequence goes there. However, uh, on those, you still have to scrub your vat. You, the key to scrubbing the vat is you really want to just brush off your the side walls of the fryer, brush off your burner tubes, heating elements. And then you want to scrape away like the oil ring. We call it like the bathtub ring <laughs> in your fryer where the oil sits all day. It leaves a little bit of polymerized oil around the ring there. You want to just scrape that with like a pot scraper, which is uh, kind of a dull, blunt putty knife. All right, next slide, please. Okay, and so then we go after you're done doing your daily filter and or filtering your fryer for the last time for the night, then we just recommend always clean your filter pan and change the filter. Filters typically can make it one day is from what we've seen. Really super high volume stores with a lot of strange fall off, you know, that's from kind of uh, different types of breading. Every now and then we'll see one that needs to have it, the filter replaced twice a day, but typically once a day is okay. Um, one of the leading things that we see for ser causing service calls is when, or causing nuisance downtime, is when the filter doesn't get replaced the night before. Maybe the night crew just said, hey, it's been busy, we're not going to change it tonight. Morning crew comes in, starts using the fryer, gets to lunch, and after lunch, they, you know, maybe they filter, and then now the oil doesn't come back up. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, we have a breakdown of how a filter pan assembly goes together. If you're using like an Evolution Elite or a filter pan assembly similar to this with a filter pad, always want to make sure that the filter pad has the rough side up. <clears throat> um, the, you'll see that there's a smooth side and rough side to filter pads. Make sure the rough side's up there. Um, for other fryers that we have, like our pressure fryers and 320 series open fryers, um, many other fryers use uh, they use like a filter envelope. And so this is another thing that really leads to service calls is on that filter envelope, you have one side that's open. And so many times what we'll see is that side that's open doesn't get clipped shut. And so our filters just kind of go back to filtration. When we filter, we're mechanically separating the oil from the contaminants within the oil. And we're taking out everything greater than about 70 microns 
and to put 70 microns into perspective, Jim Anglin gave me this little tidbit of knowledge the other day. Uh, 70 microns is about the thickness of a hair, a, he a hair on, the, on your head. So it's one of those things. We're really filtering out really tiny particles. But that's what your filter is doing. It's filtering out those tiny particles. And if it doesn't get replaced on a regular basis, those particles can fill up. Now, if you have a filter envelope like I was talking about and the side is open, now everything bigger than 70 millimeters or 70 microns is going to uh, filter in there and clog up your pump. And so a lot of times those service calls that we see because of that is just to unclog the pump. And uh, there's filter clips available that clip that if you're missing those you definitely need those or some fryers use sealer bars to seal that end i don't have a picture of the filter envelope but uh, if you have one you'll know what i'm talking about there so next slide please and so this is where i'm going to turn things over to jim anglin so i've talked about mechanical filtration and some oil best practices but Jim's got some other oil best practices to talk about. And so if you don't mind, pass the, or Jim, I guess you don't need the ball. He'll just take over from here. Sure. Thanks, Pete. So I'm Jim Anglin, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the question that Pete just brought up, which is, should I use filter powder? So Henny Penny does have a line of filter powder and filters that are impregnated with powder, and that is our prime filter products. Pete has talked about mechanical filtration and the benefits of that. Uh, what you are, are missing by not using a filter powder is that you're only getting the mechanical, the mechanical filtration only gets the solid particles. But there are still impurities that are dissolved within your oil that need to be removed if you want to truly extend your oil life and get the best quality oil. Uh, and so those impurities, often you, you hear them referred to as free fatty acids, total polar materials, or polymers. So some of the impurities, uh, some of the problems that come along with those impurities are reduced oil life, that's first and foremost. Uh, you feel that in, in your, uh, your budgets but also you have oil that starts to smoke at a lower temperature. Reduced hold times for your fried foods. So when frying in an oil that is closer to the end of life, that food, after you've taken it out of the fryer, if you're doing any sort of holding function, it's going to degrade in quality much quicker with, with poor oil quality. The oil might also start to foam. And uh, what we affectionately refer to as ring around the fryer. So that's, that's at that cooking line. And, and you'll, once you've seen it, you know what it is. Uh, those are polymers that are building up on the stainless steel. Uh, when Pete mentioned earlier that you're doing a clean out, that's one of the primary things that you're, you're taking out. Uh, but those polymers will build because the oil is degrading. When you use prime filter, it's actually taking those polymers out of the oil and not returning them into the vat. So not only are you getting a better quality oil, but it's also making it easier to clean your fryer on a daily basis. Uh, also, the, the oil will start to carbonize on either the gas heat tubes or the electric heating elements. When that happens, those heating elements or those heat exchangers have to work harder to heat your oil. So it's a reduction in energy efficiency. And then finally, the oil that is absorbed into the fried food. So uh, when you are near the end of your oil life and you have a large buildup of either total polar materials or free fatty acids in your oil, it will actually help the oil to penetrate the food and give it that greasy feel, uh, which is not obviously product, the product quality that you're going for. So again, th these are the things that the prime filter powder can help to remove that mechanical filtration simply doesn't have the ability to remove. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about what prime filter powder is. So it's a synthetic magnesium silicate. It is completely food safe. Uh, and so when you look at the different certifications that we have with that through the USDA, the FDA, it's also kosher and halal, uh, it, it is completely food safe, so you're, 
there's no need to worry about putting it in with your oil, which is being used to cook food. And, and part of the reason for that is it's, it's being filtered out. It doesn't remain in the oil that's, that goes back up into the vat and is being cooked in. So the unique properties about the synthetic magnesium silicate is that it has charged sites on its surface. You can see a picture up in the, the top right-hand corner. That's what the particles look like at 150 times magnification. And with those charged sites on the surface, they're attracting the polar compounds like free fatty acids and the uh, elements that go into total polar materials. They're attracting those. So those are dissolved impurities that can't, can't be removed through mechanical filtration, attract to this material, and then they, they get larger in size to the point where they can't pass through the filter anymore. So then they remain in your filter pan and the clean oil goes back into the vat. Um, and so that's, that's in a nutshell how it works. Next slide. So this is, a, um, this is a, a way to sort of show you the process uh, that I just described. And the filter media is in the center there. It's showing food particles that are represented by the, the small red dots. But then it's also showing the free fatty acids that get drained out. So uh, just a graphical way of showing how it works. But essentially, the, the dissolved impurities are combining with the powder and then they, they, they get filtered out by the filter media, thus returning the clean oil to your fryer. Next slide, please. So with Henny Penny Fryers, there are several different filter media options that are available, and this is a, a simple chart to help you understand what your options are. Uh, for the 320 and 340 series fryers, as well as our pressure fryers, those are primarily using the PHT filter envelopes. Those are filtering out any particles that are 70 microns or larger. We also have several options for our Evolution Elite, including the Smart Filter paper and pads, as well as the Prime Filter HD pad. So the Prime Filter HD pad is a filter pad that has Prime Filter powder impregnated into it. As you can see with that pad, it's filtering out items that are greater than one micron. So it's a much finer filter and is going to uh, make sure that the oil quality returning to your vat is even higher than the other options. All of these are very good options, uh, but it all depends on your operation and how, how, uh, how much effectiveness you want in your filter options. There are different price points and uh, different benefits that go along with each of these options. Next slide. With that, I will turn it back over to Pete, who will go through what a deep clean or clean out is. All right, well, thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Hopefully you can, <laughs> can you hear me here. I just went off a of mute here, so just wanna make sure. Yes, all good. Awesome. Okay, so let's talk about uh, deep clean. And so deep clean is, is one of these things I always like to refer back to the old term, and that's called a boil out. So if you are familiar with the term boil out, deep clean or clean out procedure is synonymous with that. However, what we don't want to do when we do a deep clean or clean out is actually boil the water. Boil out comes from older fryers without uh, kind of a, a programmed clean out mode where you just kind of turn the fryer on and let that fry, well, let the water boil. And sometimes it, well, the danger there is it can, it can evaporate off too quickly and, you know, uncover heating elements or something like that and trip the high limit. So we don't want that to happen. So, but that, this is the process, as Jim stated, you have that carbonized buildup on your burner tubes and heating elements and that ring around the fryer. This is what removes that. Uh, if, the, if deep cleans are not done, this is where, oh, this is great. If I can get my video to play, it'll show you before and after here. Thanks for playing that. It really makes a huge difference on your fryer after a clean out is thoroughly done. Um, but if a deep clean or clean out procedure is not done, that's where you're really going to see like your high limits start to trip. Just like the crumbs can insulate your high limit, so can carbonized oil. 
and it, I've seen it build up around high limit probes and cause all these intermittent high limit trips, which cause unnecessary $300 service calls just to go out and deep clean your fryer and reset the high limit. And I've seen temperature probes also get covered up, and so now our temperature readings are off because our temperature probes are insulated. So Jim already pointed out some of the benefits from doing the deep clean. I mean, it just keeps your oil tasting fresher longer and extends the oil life as well by doing this on a regular basis. Uh, next slide, please. So by regular basis, let's say, how often should a deep clean be done? And so we would recommend that you perform a deep clean every time you change your oil, um, at least once per month. So if, you know, depending on what your oil changes are, you know, change, do a deep clean at the same time, you're really going to keep your vats clean. But it, at the very maximum, don't let it go longer than a month. Uh, deep clean procedure here, you'll see you're going to overfill the vat with water. That way you're going to cut through that ring around the vat, add your fryer cleaner, you turn the fryer on. Hour for very heavily soiled fryers or 15 minutes for not so bad and then scrub, just like we saw there, just for that little clip. Um, but usually you don't want to start scrubbing until that cleaning solution has had time at 195 degrees Fahrenheit to kind of activate. And then that really loosens up those polymerized or carbonized oils uh, that build up in the vat. So that's really that procedure. Um, it is super, super important to do. Like I say, maximum once per month there or every time you change your oil. Uh, next slide. So we have a couple different cleaners available. Um, one, and I'll talk about the differences here, the one that we used in the video was a PHT dry powder. The only reason we use that in the video is because we did the video before we had Prime Cleaner available. So there's there's different a uh, couple different cleaners that we have available. The Prime Cleaner is our newest cleaner, and that one does not require a vinegar rinse. So if you're using a different cleaner, you always want to refer to the directions on your cleaner and see if it needs to be neutralized with vinegar to restore the vat back to kind of like a neutral state. Um, Prime Cleaner does not require the vinegar rinse, so it reduces labor. You don't have to fill the vat with water again, add vinegar, and then drain that, and then do a final rinse. You can just go from cleaning to do a final rinse and uh, discard your water. But again, like I say, the part numbers are there. Um, Prime Cleaner is also portioned into packets where, like if you have an Evolution Elite size vat, you just need one packet. If you have a larger vat, you'd need two that are 50 pounds of oil or greater, then it requires two. But at least they're pre-portioned, so you don't have to get a measuring cup out or anything like that to figure out how much to put in. Jim, I don't know anything else you want to add here on Prime Cleaner that I missed? Uh, no, great job, Pete. I think you described it all. Okay, and then next slide, we'll go right into maintenance. And so maintenance, the rest of this, there's not as much as what we talked about with oil because that's the majority of your maintenance. Deep cleaning your vats and taking care of oil is the majority of maintenance. Um, next slide, please. So on fryers, just a couple things I'm going to mention here, and then I'll, I'll be done and then turn things over to Clint. But a couple things left here is on for daily maintenance, uh, if you have a fryer that automatically tops off the oil, our Evolution Elite would do this, um, and it, it has a oil reservoir, or what we call a jib, which stands for jug and box, which you kind of see on the right-hand side there. Um, when your display says check jib, saying that, hey, the, the jib is empty or your auto top-off reservoir is empty, one thing I really recommend is that team members or crew members in your store replace that as soon as possible. It's just one of those things, just get it replaced. It lasts several hours after you replace it, so it's not something you have to do often, maybe just a couple times a day. But once you replace that, you know, then your fryers can start to top off again and maintain a consistent oil level. So that's one benefit. The other one is if you don't uh, replenish that uh, jib right away, then your filter or jib pump motor continues to cycle over and over, and it puts a lot of extended wear that you normally wouldn't get on your jib pump motor. And then you're going to have, you know, at some point, you know, you're going to have a premature failure on that. So that's another reason. Get it replaced right away. The connection you see on the picture on the right-hand side, right at the top of the jib, once per week, I recommend just cleaning that out, taking a towel, separate it, and clean it out. Otherwise, you get polymerized oil that builds up in there. And then when you connect that jib, 
it no longer makes the firm connection, and then you get the check jib message even though your jib is full. So things that you can avoid, service calls that can be avoided. Uh, next slide, please. So this one seems simple, weekly. <laughs> Clean your casters. I know this is one that gets, you know, it sometimes can get neglected. We're busy in stores. But just take a bottle of food grade degreaser, spray down your, your casters once per week, let that degreaser kind of sit on those for you know, a couple minutes, and then come by with a brush and some rinse water. Make sure not to splash, but just kind of rinse them off. What that does is it keeps your casters from, it keeps them spinning. So many times you go in the store and you see casters with flat spots on the bottom of them. Um, and because the casters no longer spin and they grind on the floor and create flat spots. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so then quarterly maintenance on our fryers. Then we have, if you have a fryer that's got O-rings, so our Evolution Elite has that. There's a couple other models that we have with O-rings on them. Anytime you see O-rings, replace those one time every quarter. Um, this is going to be a proactive measure to make sure that you're not going to be caught at some point where you have oil in your drain pan, and when you try to pump that oil back up, all you get are air bubbles back. That's what happens when O-rings wear out. They no longer create a tight seal, so air gets sucked in right around those rather than pumping oil from the drain pan. If you want to stay ahead of that game, replace them quarterly. Um, and, and that's our recommendation there. If you, and you know, another tip here, I got the part numbers on the screen. So the part numbers I want to just point out, um, the 74189 is for the red rings, like you see in the picture on the left. Those are a little bit smaller, the ones on the right-hand side for the gas uh, evolution elites and some of our other fryers, 175860. Now, with those O-rings, just one other tip is I've seen people go to a hardware store, replace those. The hardware store O-rings just do not cut it when it comes to temperature rating, and typically they'll just melt or dissolve. So these are, I think they're more of a Viton-based uh, O-ring that can withstand, you know, 400-plus degrees. Uh, next slide, please. And then my last slide here is just sum everything up. Daily enforce oil best practices filter when prompted, replace your filter, replace the jib as needed. Weekly replace or clean your casters, uh, replace oil as needed. One last thing here is with your oil, when you replace your oil, if you're doing that on a normal interval like every seven days, but now you've changed your oil practices to filter more often and take care of the oil a little bit better, reevaluate the time you change your oil because you may find that now my oil lasts 10 days or it lasts 14 days because we're, my team is taking care of it. That is where you see the money savings. Um, that's exactly where we want to get. So depend, every store, it seems like a restaurant, a lot of different methods to test oil. Some test TPM, some go by color, some by pH, but those are things we want to check. Uh, just make sure that maybe your oil doesn't need to be changed yet uh, every seven days if that's your current interval. Monthly, perform a deep clean. Quarterly, change O-rings. Uh, clean the auto top-off, ATO for auto top-off or jib, the quick connection. And then annually, very important, get with your local service company or your 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 service company. Henny Penny has a distributor network. We recommend calling them. They're knowledgeable on our fryers and they can perform an annual PM or plan maintenance. But those are things to do this to really eliminate unnecessary downtime, increase your uptime. And with that said, I'm going to turn things over to Clint to talk about serial number lookup here. And that's it for me. Thanks, Jim and Pete, for sharing your expertise with all of, expertise with all of us today. More information on how to clean and troubleshoot your Henny Penny Fryer will be heading your way in our post-event email. Uh, and now I'm going to ask for the controls so I can demo the serial number lookup. Um, Henny Penny is one of 25 plus manufacturers participating in our serial number lookup feature on partsound.com. If you haven't seen this feature, it's a great way to find the specific parts associated with your Henny Penny equipment. You can search um, by serial number in a number of ways. Can you guys see my screen here? Yes. So you can, you can go to the search by serial box and find your OEM here, or you can type in 
the OEM and find search, and you'll be returned uh, to see the uh, information that um, will enable the quick and easy search by serial. So this red box that is populate, populated um, with any penny, if you type in a serial number, um, here I've got a serial number to show you guys. So right now, I'll highlight that we have uh, 10,499 part numbers to choose from. It's a bit overwhelming, um, which is, is one of the huge benefits of this feature. Click on that button and you will be quickly directed to the view of the 24 parts that are in the bill of materials for this uh, unit. So very quickly and, and accurately you're brought to all the parts in the aftermarket that you might need to replace um, with this any penny unit. Um, so it takes the guesswork out of the product question and immediately you get the right, right answer. If you notice here uh, in the red and the yellow box, you see um, there's warranty information. So um, in this particular case, this is, was in, in warranty uh, a number of years ago, a testament to the unit is still out and running. Um, and you can quickly see the fact that we've got uh, all the 24 parts here ready for, for quick identification and order placement. So um, we're really excited to bring this feature to life and, and helping to make you know, the buying experience quick and easy um, for, for, for Henny Penny and other manufacturers. So um, if, uh, if we have time, uh, we do have a little bit more time. We have a couple of questions in the queue. Um, so here's a question from the team. What, what are the warning signs that filtering is overdue on my unit? Okay, so <clears throat> this is Pete. I'll just jump in here. So if filtering is overdue on your unit, um, sometimes what we'll see there is you, you really will start to see that, hey, maybe, like I said before, your high limit starts to trip. That would be an extreme case where filtering is overdue. Um, but really, it's one of those things that over time, if you have newer oil, it might be hard to tell right away, but you're going to see your oil degrade. Um, you're going to see that oil degrade faster, and you might be like, oh, my gosh, we probably need to filter a little bit more often uh, than what we're doing. Some, you know, so sometimes just from the surface, it's kind of hard to tell unless you start having really big issues like your high limit tripping. It's one of those things just to be mindful of. Maybe, maybe better to better put this, and I know I'm being long-winded here. A better way to put this is if you drain your oil and you see the crumbs accumulated where they are actually in contact with your heating element or your burner tubes, that's when you know it's been it's too late. Okay, that's helpful. What are the differences between a Henny Penny filter and a generic filter? Um, so, so, yeah, Jim, you want to start on that one? Sure. So, one of the main differences between a, a generic and a Henny Penny filter, the genuine Henny Penny filters have been tested by our engineering staff to ensure the optimal performance as well as oil quality. Okay. So we have another another one uh, from the audience. I'm sorry, we lost it. One, one second. Driving issues. <laughs> what did What did Pete say about having your jib display for fill jib when the jib is already full? Can you clarify that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you, so any fryers that have an automatic top off system, they give any of ours at Henny Penny, they give you an alert when that auto top off system is no longer full of oil. So what the fryer does is it tries to fill from your auto top off, let's say it's a reservoir on the fryer or a jib like the picture we saw. The fryer tries to fill, and if it tries eight times and doesn't successfully see the oil level raise 
up to the sensor, then it gives you that message, check jib on some of our fryers. Some say jib is low, and others will say check ATO reservoir. And so any of those messages, if you get those, but your reservoir is you know, full or your jib is full, what happens there typically is the connection isn't being made. So where your quick connect is, um, if that gets full of polymerized, gooey, glue-like oil, you try to click that quick connect together, it feels like it engaged, but with all that buildup of oil, it really didn't. And so what the fryer's trying to do is trying to fill top off eight times, but it wasn't successful. And so that's, that's a scenario where the fryer says, okay, check your jib, but then you go to check it, and it is actually full. So what needs to be done there is, you know, check the connection. There could be other things that go on, but that's the most common one we see is the connection just is dirty and needs to be cleaned and reattached. Hopefully that makes sense. Yep. We've got another one. Uh, should I be adding filter powder to my filter box or directly to the oil? So I'll, I'll take that one. That is really a, a personal preference. It will work either way. Um, for some restaurant operations where the, the fryer is visible to, to guests, there's uh, less comfort in adding it directly into the fryer uh, because the guests may not understand that it's a food grade material. Uh, but it, it's effective in, in either application. And again, just to reiterate, when it goes through the filtration process, all of the powder is being removed by the filter media and staying in the filter pan. Okay. Um, you know, in respect for everyone's time, I think we need, we need to wrap this up. I want to thank everyone for attending the webinar. And Jim and Pete, your expertise is, is great, great to share with, the, with this group. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up um, survey along with some uh, additional content in, in email form for those that signed up, so look for that. Um, we'd love to offer more events like this in the future, so your feedback will help us to inform us on topics and formats and timing that best meets your needs moving forward. Again, thanks to uh, our presenters from Hemi Penny for your time and valuable information. Everyone have a great afternoon.